At Seventh-day Adventists, we talk a lot about diet. We love diet. Well, at least, at least we love food, right? We saw that last night at the reception. The food disappeared uh, faster than anyone expected. Um, and uh, we had a delicious lunch today, and I didn't see very many people skipping it. Um, we all love to eat, and certainly part of our genes as a church is food. Maybe sometimes to the extreme. But uh, we're going to focus on nutrition and, and some of the health issues around it. I want to, one of the things we're going to talk about this afternoon is a philosophy of nutrition. I have the opportunity of traveling the world now and everywhere I go, I find that there is controversy, not on exercise, not on sleep, not on um, whatever. Nobody ever argues about exercise, but they all argue about food. And I want to spend a little bit of time addressing that issue, because I think it's a very important one of balance. We also have a very special guest uh, from the Czech Republic, a nutritionist, researcher, and she is going to talk about diet as it relates to probably the most rapidly growing health problem in the world today called diabetes. And we're delighted that Hannah can be with us. I'm going to introduce her a little later. And following her presentation, we're going to allow a little time for questions for relative to hers. At the end, we're leaving some time for questions that you might like to ask relative to my presentations. And, but following uh, Dr. Hannah's presentation, we are going to um, have a short presentation by Dr. John Scharfenberg, someone who is probably not unfamiliar to many of you. Um, and he is a, I guess I can say it, John, you're an old friend. Um, Dr. Scharfenberg watched me when I was a young boy, baby actually. Um, so that tells you a little bit about his age as well as mine. But we have a full afternoon, and I'm delighted that you have chosen to come, and I trust that it will be a, a blessing and an inspiration to each one of you. I'm going to be standing behind the mic. I think all of us will be because um, we're not, we don't have the freedom because of the, of the TV recordings of moving around. They've asked that we stand here and so I guess we'll be like uh, pillars of salt um, in that respect. But as we begin, I would like to ask you to bow your heads with me as we invite God to be with us. Father in heaven, we are thankful for the wonderful blessings that you give to each one of us, for clear minds, for the ability to attend seminars and learn to expand our creativity and the talents that you have given to each one represented here. We ask that your presence and your spirit would be very real here this afternoon. Enlighten us, strengthen us, that we may be more effective in doing the work you have called each of us to do is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was asked to organize this workshop this afternoon, I was asked, given one special request, and that was to make this first presentation. There's no PowerPoint with this one. Uh, it's a presentation that I made at the Adventist Nutrition Council uh, last February, connected with the International Congress on Vegetarian Nutrition uh, that was held at Loma Linda University. And, uh, we had a, a delightful time with 
uh, a large group of people who came for the Friday night and the Sabbath afternoon sessions that the General Conference Nutrition Council sponsored. And on Friday evening, I presented a paper, and by the way, all of the presentations, and Hannah, I need to get your permission before I do this, but all of, all of my presentations, including the one this morning, Dr. Landless's and Dr. Handyside's, will all be online at healthministries.com. And we will post all of these here. And the paper that I'm going to share with you um, right now will be there as well. But it won't be there until tomorrow. I have to give me a little bit of time to do that. The question I often get asked is why do Seventh-day Adventists recommend a vegetarian diet? And I want to just give you a little bit of a historical perspective as we begin this seminar. I think there are three basic reasons why Seventh-day Adventists are interested in vegetarian eating. One is for health reasons. The other is for spiritual reasons. And a third is for ecological reasons. And so I'm going to try to cover those in that order. But I'd like to first review with you what the official position is of the church. Now, the official position may differ from what some people representing the church may teach. But the official position is this. In the baptismal vow under number 22, well, actually, it's in it's, it's on Christian beliefs, uh, number 22, simply says, along with adequate rest and ec exercise, we are to adopt the most healthful diet possible and abstain from unclean foods identified in scripture. And that is what the Christian belief, which is part of the fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church says relative to diet. If you read onward in the book Seventh-day Adventist Believe, it says, the diet ordained in the Garden of Eden, the vegetarian diet, is the ideal. But sometimes we cannot have the ideal. In those circumstances, in any given situation or locale, those who wish to stay in optimum health will eat the best food that they can obtain. The working policy, which is the policy manual of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the section under health ministries and on page 303 says this, the church advocates that positive steps be taken to develop a healthful lifestyle and encourages a balanced vegetarian diet. It requires of its members the non-use of alcoholic beverages and tobacco it also requires the non-use of other drugs except in a recognized evidence-based therapeutic context. The church encourages the avoidance of flesh foods. Physical well-being and clarity of mind are usually interdependent and clarity of mind is essential for discernment between right and wrong and between truth and error. Every once in a while, I have somebody that comes up to me and says, but that isn't strong enough. But I wanted to share with you as we begin the policy, the official position, if you will, of the church of which I think almost all of us are members. We do not require a vegetarian diet. A vegetarian diet is not a test of fellowship. It is something that is recommended. Recognizing that in some circumstances or some locales on the face of this globe, it may not be possible to eat a healthy vegetarian diet. 
Now all of us come from, I think most of us, if not all of us here today, come from economically advantaged areas of the world where we can probably afford almost any kind of diet that we would choose to purchase and eat. But there are other parts of the world where people live a bit differently than we do, without as many advantages as we have. And those advantages may be economic, they also may be simply knowledge. So having said that, Seventh-day Adventists believe that we are stewards or managers of the gifts that God has given to us. And we each are managers of the talents, abilities, and resources that God has entrusted to us. And simply living longer, living better, is a dividend, as I suggested this morning, of making good choices. It's not the primary reason for making those good choices. There has to be something beyond the pursuit of health, the skinny body, the healthy, the healthy lifestyle, as good as those things are. And during the formative years of our church, there was a rapid, it, it, the church took place in an era of rapid social and scientific change. There were reform movements, as have already been suggested, in temperance and women's rights and labor management relations, abolition, dress, sex education, and the list goes on for the reforms that were being promoted. Most of the movements were active no more than 10 years before they really went dormant. Although abolition, that is the abolition for slavery, was a notable exception. Of all the reforms that were popular at the time this church was being formed, only health survived in the Seventh-day Adventist church. During the first half of the 19th century, there was general unfamiliarity with the principles of healthful living and the treatment of disease. However, in both Europe and in the United States, there was increasing interest in temperance, therapeutic reform and diet reform. Health and diet reform were especially promoted by individuals that are known in history. Their names are Trawl, Jackson, Alcott, Graham, Coles, Horace Mann. Those represent the major ones on the American side of the Atlantic. These were all active during those formative years of our church. And the issues these men and others vigorously supported included opposition to the use of tea and coffee, alcohol, tobacco, natural remedies, and various kinds and forms of dietary reform. While not pioneers in many of the principles of health reform, Adventists do claim the uniqueness of integrating them into the theology of our belief. This integration into the third angel's message made health a vital part of our church teaching and accounts for the strong emphasis that we place on the intimate relationship between the human body and mind to the religious experience that we, that we have. Today we want to examine this philosophy of health, particularly as it relates to the vegetarian diet. Initially, only a few Adventists prior to 1863 adopted some of the health reforms. There were basically none. There, were, there was essentially one. His name was the ship captain, Joseph Bates. And before, long before the organization, even the founding of this church, he had stopped drinking, stopped smoking, and he had become a vegetarian. But he did not speak about it. In fact, history tells us that when asked why he didn't eat certain things, he said, I've eaten enough of them in my life. And that was his gentle response. It wasn't until the prophet was received a vision in 1863 on health, following that, that he felt like this was something that he could talk about in public. And of course, he was, 
he lived, I mean, he was an older man when the church was formed, but he was probably the healthiest of all the pioneers um, and uh, was a remarkable man. Principally through the strong influence of Ellen White's visions, there was a growing adoption and integration of these dietary and other health reforms after that June 5, 1863 vision. In tracing the development of health reform in Adventist thought and philosophy during the years, uh, during the early years, Gerard Domstedt, now at the seminary and originally from Holland, divides these into two periods. First, the growth of thinking on religion and health, and he dates those 1848 to 1863. That's the first period, and one of the first appeals used to stress healthful living in the early years was its relationship to improve spirituality. And a number of the early pioneers joined that plea. Articles were published in the early church papers pointing out that religion for its full development demands all of our mental powers. Great importance was also placed on the body of the temple of God and, the in, and the, as the habitation of the Holy Spirit. And so an individual's responsibility to preserve the human body was to do so in the best possible way. Another text that was cited in the early publications of our church was Paul's statement in Romans, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And so healthful living also came to be seen as an essential part of a preparation for the second advent of Christ. The emphasis was placed on the necessity of cleansing the body and the spirit and perfecting holiness. A third appeal during this time was made for health during this period was made for healthful that was made for healthful living was as a means of saving money to finance the mission of the church. And as the early church attempted to expand there was huge demand for financial support and appeals were made for the denial of unhealthful practices so that money saved in this way could be put into the treasury of the Lord. Going back again, the second period of time that Dr. Domstedt uses in his history of the church relative to the health message is from 1863 to 1874. And during this time, there was a lot more emphasis that was placed on healthful living habits. A major reason for this growing emphasis was the visions that Ellen White received in 1863 and then again in 1865. And it, it came to be seen as an intelligent understanding of the laws of health and life and nature, which were seen as the divine law, extensions of the divine law of God, resulting in a series of reformations so that members could enjoy the greatest measure of physical, mental, and spiritual health. In 1867, Ellen White stated that health reform is a part of the third angel's message and is just as closely connected with this message as the arm and the hand with the human body. This is, that's the first time that right arm analogy or arm and body analogy was made. A basic tenet of health reform suggested that transgression of the natural laws of the human organism was a moral issue and thus sinful if not observed. Transgression of these laws were considered as transgressions of the Ten Commandments, particularly the one thou shalt not kill, referring to killing oneself. The integration of health reform into the third angel's message took place because the central theme of that message called people to the observance of God's commandments. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. There were a number of rationales that were used during this period 
to encourage the early members to pay attention to the choices that they made in terms of their lifestyle. One was that a linking a disregard of health with the sixth commandment, thou shall not kill, was concluded that it's morally wrong to do anything tending to shorten one's life or others. A second was saw disobedience to the laws of the human organism in the context of God's creatorship, thus making transgression of them a sinful act. And another approach recognized the violation of the laws of health affected by physical, mental, and the spiritual constitution of man. For example, the effect of the use of alcoholic beverages on the body was that it impaired the mind, which in turn negatively affected spirituality and decision-making relative to what is right and wrong. And in 1866, Ellen White summarized this by saying, every violation of principle in eating and drinking blunts the perceptive facilities, making it impossible for them to appreciate or place the right value upon eternal things. And there she, she continued in that, same, uh, in that same paragraph to avoid indulging and encourage people to eat the simplest of foods prepared in simple manner that the fine nerves of the brain be not weakened, benumbed, or paralyzed. Now that's just a very brief and, and uh, quick review of how the concepts of healthful living became integrated into Seventh-day Adventist thought and belief. It's important to note that several doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church have greatly influenced thinking in regard to healthful living and diet. For instance, a major building block in the church's philosophy has been the holistic view of man, which we talked about from several different angles this morning. Seventh-day Adventists reject the Greek separation of the body and the soul, and its corollary, the immortality of the soul. Instead, we accept the unitary view of Hebrew thought. Body and spirit are united in a person, often referred to in scripture as a mortal man, and life is seen as a continuing moment-by-moment -moment gift, not a state conferred at some point in the past. The Adventist concept of salvation is strongly influenced by this view of man. If man is a whole, then God needs to save him as a whole. Jesus' mission was not the only justification of sinners, but also their sanctification through a growing conformity with God's will by the indwelling of his Holy Spirit. S. N. Haskell, an early Adventist theologian, said every true Christian should therefore take a broader view of Christ's mission than merely to say, God forgives sins. In forgiving of, its, of sin, it should be remembered that there is also a removing of the effects of sin, and sickness is one of those effects. Thus, Adventists place the law of nature alongside the moral law and believe that man is called to obey both. The doctrine of the body of the, as the temple of God is also fundamental to our belief in terms of the choices that we recommend for our members. And this blends the principles of true stewardship, that as humans we're only managers of that which God has entrusted to us with the doctrine of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that we may truly glorify him in our bodies as in our spirits, how requisite that we possess in full vigor all powers of the physical being. Thank God that this subject is now being especially set before our people. That's what Jay and Andrews said. And so with this as a background, let's quickly review the biblical support for a vegetarian diet. In scripture, the diet covering the history of man can really be divided into three distinct periods. The original diet, found in Genesis 1.29, the diet modified with the addition of the herb of the field, Genesis 3.18, and thirdly, the second modification permitting the use of flesh foods, 
in Genesis 9. We often refer to the Eden diet, and we usually are referring to what is, would be called the pre-fall diet, that is before the fall of man. And in his innocence, man was given in the garden every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. The next verse makes it clear that God made distinction in the diet of man and animal. For to the animals he gave the green plants for food. And Ellen White wrote in 1864, God gave our first parents the food he designed that the race should eat. It was contrary to his plan to have the life of any creature taken. There was to be no death in Eden. The fruit of the trees in the garden was the food of, that man's wants required. Then there's the post-fall diet. After man exercised his free choice, sin entered this earth, and man was driven from his original home in Eden. Two dietary choices, two dietary changes took place. First, man lost access to the tree of life. And second, he was told to eat the herb of the field. Ellen White comments, grains, fruits, nuts, and vegetables constitute the diet chosen for us by our creator. And that's probably one of the most familiar phrases among us. The post-fall diet, now about 1,650 years, 1,650 years later, as Noah's family came from the ark, I'm sorry, the post-flood diet, um, about 1,650 years uh, after the Garden of Eden, if we understand Bible chronology correctly, man left the ark Onto and faced a very desolate earth after the flood, and another modification was made. When every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. And to this, Ellen White enlarges this thought by saying, before this time, God had given men no permission to eat animal food. He intended that the race should subsist wholly upon the productions of the earth, but now that every green thing had been destroyed, he allowed them to eat the flesh of the clean beasts that had been preserved in the ark. The phrase every moving thing has been interpreted in various ways in Christian thought, and it might be understood as licensed to eat anything. However, this was probably not the intention, for prior to the flood, God had ordered Noah to preserve only one pair of each of the unclean animals in contrast to seven of the clean. And this limited the killing of animals for an emergency food supply to the clean animals of which could be spared for slaughter. Now why did God make this modification of the original diet? I think there are two reasons that present themselves. First, every green thing had been destroyed and not enough time had elapsed for new plants to develop. This was an emergency provision. After the flood, people ate largely of animal food. Genealogical records indicate that during the next 500 years, the lifespan of man was cut from Noah's 950 years to Abraham's 175, and not many generations following Abraham, 80 years was considered to be a long and good life. When God led his people out of Egypt, he again provided a diet of his choosing in the form of manna. We're told that he provided them with the food best adapted for this purpose, not flesh, but manna the bread of heaven. This was a unique food. Never had been seen before, never has been seen afterwards. Although the other day, somebody gave me a package of manna. And they said, and as I talked to them, they began to tell me that they were selling it. And it clued me into what their interest was. 
didn't particularly look white and fluffy, and I didn't even taste it. It looked old and moldy, actually. This was a very unique food containing all the essential nutrients for men's sustenance. I would like to have eaten it. And maybe someday I can. Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14 contain the classifications of the clean and the unclean animals. And while it might appear that these distinctions were new, the experience of Cain and Abel suggests that Adam was aware of the sacrificial system and its regulations, which included an understanding of the clean and the unclean. As there's no record that Noah had any questions about which animals to save in pairs and pairs of seven and which to save in a single pair, it's plausible to assume that Noah did not need any instructions as he already knew what was clean and unclean. And thus the Levitical codes delineating the clean and the unclean animals was simply a repetition of a classification known to those who lived even before the period of the, of the, of the Levites. It was now repeated to Israel at Sinai, the same as the sacrificial ceremonial law and the moral law. What's the difference between those two laws? The sacrificial laws were made up of symbols pointing to Christ's mission, sacrifice, and priesthood, and these were to be performed by the Hebrews until Christ's death when they were to cease. However, the moral law was never to cease for all ages. When we look at the moral law, we can see that it, there's, a, there's a moral code of law, there's a national code of law, and the last division is a natural law. All the laws of nature are the laws of God. In every detail, they express God's purpose and love for his creatures. So we say, what about eating of flesh foods? Not only was permission to eat it granted under emergency situations, and its use restricted to emergency situations. But this practice was further guarded by other regulations that we find in great detail in the book of Leviticus regarding the use of fat or, or, or the, the consumption of fat, of blood and the fat of the animals. The Talmud records that the Hebrews were to re prepare their meat or, or how it was to be prepared and it was to be chopped into small pieces pounded, soaked, and washed. And then it was put into a muslin cloth and beaten with a woolen, wooden mallet to express what fluid remained in it yet. Treated in this way, it became tasteless, and it was customary to add leeks and onions and garlic to give it flavor. Apparently, God never intended for meat to be eaten as it is today. We all are acquainted with the story of the Apostolic Council in the book of Acts when a session was called of the early church leaders over the question of whether or not the observance of the ceremonial law should be required of Gentile converts. And James, the chairman of this council, rendered the decision that the requirements to be emphasized to the Gentiles was to abstain from things polluted by idols from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. Many stop here because they feel that not only has the ceremonial law been ended, but that the natural laws of the, Levit of the Levitical code were ended also. To them, the health laws given by God to Israel, the laws of sanitation and hygiene for individuals, the home and the nation, the instructions regarding food and its preparation, and especially the use of meat, were all wiped out. And yet James continues in Acts 15, verse 21, for Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. This verse completes James' summary of the council's decisions. And while some scholars entertain different views as to the meaning of this, the best interpretation suggests that the instruction in the natural laws of Moses were still being read faithfully on Sabbath 
and that the apostles felt it necessary to emphasize to the Gentile converts these special points that relate so definitely to their physical and moral safety. And so, to the, so the purpose of God's love in many ways, in many laws given through Moses, which were neither ceremonial nor temporary, was to safeguard the moral law of God. And the Levitical codes regarding the food, sanitation, and hygiene were included in these. Now what about a diet for the remnant church? Paul, after recounting the wanderings of Israel in the wilderness, admonishes those who are living at the end of the age not to lust after evil things, 1 Corinthians 10. It's interesting to note, as Dr. Shea and Davidson, Dr. Shea was at the seminary, he's passed away now. Dr. Davidson is still there in the Old Testament, both of them Old Testament scholars, has pointed out that the Levitical codes were given in the first section of the book as a preparation for the Day of Atonement. And on this day, all secular interests and work was stopped. It was a day of complete fasting. All were required to be clean physically and to put away all sins. And Seventh-day Adventists believe that since 1844, we have been living in the antitypical Day of Atonement and that the heavenly high priest is in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary about to complete the investigative judgment. This is a time for the cleansing of the body, a searching of the soul, and fasting. And what is the fasting for those living in this day of an antitypical day of atonement? In 1896, Ellen White wrote, the true fasting which should be recommended to all is abstinence from every stimulating kind of food and the proper use of wholesome, simple food which God has provided in abundance. It would appear that flesh foods have no place in the diet that God has chosen for people at this time of Earth's history. The use of such foods are repeatedly spoken of as stimulating. God's diet calls for the avoidance of every type of stimulation and an intelligent use of simple foods, choosing to live in such a way as to always have clarity of thought and of mind. The Bible re records that when God had a special work to be done, he entrusts special individuals or special people with the task and then counsels them regarding diet and healthful living. We only have to look at the story of Samson, of Daniel, of John the Baptist, and the Advent people. John the Baptist, who represents those today who are called to prepare a people for Christ's second return, lived and ate very simply. Of Daniel and his three companions who were tempted on the very issue that we are discussing today, we read, they do not, did not move capriciously, but intelligently. They decided that as flesh meat had not composed the diet in the past, their diets in the past, it should not come into their diet in the future. It's interesting that even in that time of captivity, there were some in Israel who maintained the type of diet that was committed to God's remnant people. In the seventh chapter of Isaiah, the well-known prophecy of Christ's virgin birth says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And yet less well-known is the next verse, which is an integral part of the same prophecy. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he might know to refuse the evil and choose the good. The phrase butter and honey or milk and honey occurs 22 times in scripture. And without exception, it describes completeness, fullness, adequacy. Any land, for example, whose rivers flowed with milk and honey had everything that people needed. And thus, the Hebrew phrase regarding a diet of milk and honey indicates one that lacks nothing and is completely adequate. It's not a literal description necessarily of the elements of the diet, but rather a figure of speech saying it, it was a diet that had everything that was needed. And so the prophet goes on record that Christ would eat a completely adequate diet 
that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. And so Christ set an example for us in living in harmony with physical law that his moral discernment might not be impaired. And when dying on the cross, Christ refused the drink offered him lest he lose clarity of mind even for a moment. In the new earth, as in Eden of old, at the beginning of, of Eden of old, at the beginning, scripture records that there will be no destruction of life. They shall not hurt nor destroy in my, whole, in my holy mountain, says the Lord. Those who have the privilege of living there will once more subsist on the products of the earth. Ezekiel wrote along the bank of the river and in this side and that will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. And John the Revelator saw the same vision of the heavenly home where sin would be banished, death abolished, and there would be no killing of animals. Just as there was no sin and no death at the beginning of Eden, so there will be in Eden restored the new earth. Seventh-day Adventists believe that life on this earth today is a preparation for eternal life in the earth made new. And thus it would seem logical that the people of God today would choose in every possible respect to live a lifestyle here that emulates the lifestyle which will be experienced in the new earth, including a vegetarian diet. From time to time, we hear negative outcomes about vegetarians. We may be able to explain these, these by flawed research, but maybe not. There have always been those who questioned the value of God's simple way of living and eating. I had to chuckle a few weeks ago, actually a few months ago now, when I read about Apple Corporation's disappointing financial results. And yet it was the most profitable quarter in the history of the company. And its profits were greater than that of Microsoft and IBM combined. And yet the Wall Street pundits and the stock market pundits were saying there was something wrong. There was something wrong with the company. The weight of evidence is strongly in favor today of a balanced, well-chosen vegetarian diet. And yet following God's way has always required faith. And we will probably never see the time when all questions are settled. Our way of living, of eating, has always stretched our faith and always will in some way until the Lord returns. I am not discouraged, nor am I dismayed. Throughout the history of this world, there have been those who have chosen, even at great risk, to eat a diet that is in harmony with that provided by God to Adam and Eve in the very beginning, and which will be restored in Eden when the Lord returns. There's strong support for this vegetarian diet from scripture and of course from the writings of God's prophet. In preparing for this paper, I was surprised by the lack of clear discussion on this topic by Adventist theologians, particularly as the dietary and health laws of the Old Testament relate to the call of holiness and preparation with the inherent promise of power to accomplish what is necessary. You and I are living in the final days of this world's history. Christ looked prophetically down the stretches of time and saw the world awash with moral pollution of every kind, and to protect us from these delusions by keeping our minds clear and sharp, God in his infinite wisdom and love gave his remnant people the wonderful scientifically vindicated message of health reform, including dietary reform. This message given in language that all can understand describes a lifestyle that preserves above and beyond its many health benefits the moral integrity of man. And so the Apostle John expressed his great longing when he wrote, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. <laughs>